On September 1, 2020, the leadership of an Ewe nationalist group, the Western Togoland Restoration Front, declared the creation of a new independent state in Ghana, Western Togoland. Wedged between Lake Volta and the Ghana-Togo border, the area includes parts of at least five Ghanan regions, Volta, Oti, Northern Region, Northeast Region, and Upper East Region. And seemingly out of nowhere, a relatively obscure separatist movement from West Africa was trending online. Well, at least for like a day. But the story of Western Togoland, not unexpectedly, goes back quite a bit further than 2020, stretching all the way to the latter stages of the scramble for Africa in the 19th century, when for a brief period in world history, Germany had the third largest colonial empire in Africa. Unique among other European powers, Germany had no colonies of its own by the beginning of the 1880s. And the Iron Chancellor himself, Otto von Bismarck, was kind of alright with that. Now, this is not to say he was entirely opposed to the concept of a colonial empire, but rather, Bismarck was a pragmatist above all else, and he understood the risk a forceful colonial policy posed for a newly unified German state. Despite this, in a remarkably short period of time, Germany was able to acquire a number of colonial holdings in Africa and the Asia Pacific. Honestly, the history of Germany's colonial empire is deserving of its own full episode, and that's probably something I'll do in the not too distant future. The desire to rebuild this empire was very real well into World War II. But for the purposes of discussing events occurring in Ghana, all that really needs to be known is that, among its four colonial holdings on the African continent, there was one colony that stood apart from the rest, the Protectorate of Togoland. Situated between the British Gold Coast and the French colony of Daome, Togoland was only 130 miles wide on average, but it extended nearly 400 miles north from the Bight of Benin. Within its borders existed nearly 40 distinct ethnic groups, the most prominent being the Ewe, who inhabited the south. The Protectorate was established in July 1884, following negotiations between the celebrated German explorer Gustav Nautengal, then serving as Special Commissioner for West Africa, and the King of Togo. Dominated by extensive lagoons and marshes, German influence was largely restricted to Togoland's coastal regions until the early 1890s, when individuals ventured out into its unexplored hinterlands, where they found oil palms, rubber vines, timber, and dye wood. Possessing a relatively temperate climate, colonial officials were able to foster agricultural development, and cotton soon emerged as the protectorate's most important crop, with an average export of some 500 to 550 tons by 1900. This spurred economic development in the early 20th century, which in turn allowed for the protectorate to become the first to dispense with an imperial subsidy. Kaiser Wilhelm II and other proponents of Germany's colonial venture took great pride in this achievement, often referring to Togoland as the showcase or model colony. However, it should be noted that much of this was achieved in part through a combination of forced labor and excessive taxation. Resistance to German rule, though, was decidedly less pronounced in Togoland than it was in other colonial holdings, where you had events like the Maji Maji Rebellion and the Herero Wars, which ultimately led to the first genocide of the 21st century in what is now Namibia. The petition of October 12, 1913 is a fairly on-the-point example of this, in which a number of the protectorate's African elite submitted a petition to the German colonial secretary, urging for economic, legal, and political reforms. All things considered, German rule was decidedly more relaxed in Togoland, but with the onset of World War I, it came to an end almost as quickly as it had begun. Togoland was completely unprepared for war, being the only colony in West Africa without its own standing army. Rather, the German protectorate was safeguarded by a paramilitary police force largely composed of African non-commissioned officers and irregulars. Fully aware of this, Duke Adolf Friedrich of Mecklenburg, the governor of Togoland, sought to avoid war as best he could, pointing to a clause signed by Britain, France, Belgium, and Germany at the Berlin Conference in 1885 Friedrich argued the conventional basin of the Congo, which included nearly all of Central Africa, was to be neutral during times of war. Moreover, the aforementioned nations were to refrain from carrying out hostilities in the neutralized territories and from using them as basis for warlike operations. Yet, yeah, no one really seemed to care. 
and the French invaded Togoland on August 6, occupying the town of Little Popo. Less than a week later, the British entered the protectorate's capital of Lome and proceeded northward. Sporadic fighting occurred near the Chara River, where German forces had entrenched themselves. But, after withdrawing to Kamina and proceeding to destroy a powerful radio station, thereby denying its capture to Allied forces, they offered their unconditional surrender on August 26. Togoland was then divided into French and British administrative zones, which eventually fell under a League of Nations Class B mandate in 1922. It remained as such until 1946, whereupon it became a United Nations Trust Territory. Roughly a decade later, the French-administered portion of Togoland became a nominally autonomous region within the French Union, while British Togoland opted to join the Gold Coast following a referendum in May 1956. Thus, British Togoland, often called Transvolta Togo, was absorbed into the Gold Coast, later becoming part of Her Majesty's Dominions, which on March 6, 1957, at exactly midnight, became the independent dominion of Ghana. And on July 1, 1960, the Republic of Ghana was declared. <laughs> Citizens of the new state of Ghana gather for the celebration marking their day of freedom from colonialism. What was once the Gold Coast of British colony now becomes an independent commonwealth. Vice President and Mrs. Nixon represent the United States at the three-day festivities. Ghana's new army passes in review before the American educated premier and Deputy Secretary Ralph Bunch of the United Nations. Another feature of the occasion is a beauty contest in which the fairest of the land compete. And here is Miss Ghana herself. First queen of a brand new republic. Just a few months before this, on April 27th, Togo severed its constitutional ties with France, along with its UN trusteeship status, becoming the fully independent Togolese Republic. But not everyone was happy. In the former Gold Coast, the Togoland Congress, a political party founded in 1951 which campaigned for the unification of the Ewe people, opposed integration with Ghana. Or wait, is it union? The precise wording in the 1956 referendum gave rise to an argument over its overall lawfulness. There were also questions about whether representatives from British Togoland should have been present during negotiations over the Ghana Independence Act of 1957 which eventually resulted in Togoland, the British portion of it, becoming part of Ghana. And over half a decade later, these questions, along with claims of systemic economic and political underdevelopment, have given fuel to a separatist movement in East Ghana, primarily centered in the Volta region. Perhaps the best known group advocating for self-determination and independence of Western Togoland, plus they're a member of the Unrepresented Nations and Peoples Organization, is the Homeland Study Group Foundation. Founded in 1994 by Charles, this guy, also known as Papavi, members of the group were charged with treason following an unsuccessful attempt in 2017 to declare independence. I really did try my best with the pronunciation, but Google Translate was no help and it was not going to be pretty, so yeah, we'll just move on. Two years later, eight members, including Papavi himself, faced similar charges after a raid on one of their meetings in which authorities claimed the group was in the final stages of preparing to declare Western Togoland independence, again. Around 80 members were then arrested for intending to demonstrate against their leader's arrest. These charges were eventually dropped though, and Papavi was released on bail. This pretty much was the situation until September 1, 2020, when the leadership of another group, the previously mentioned Western Togoland Restoration Front, declared, redeclared, the sovereignty of Western Togoland. After this, the group set up signs welcoming people to their little breakaway nation. But as things like this do, events quickly escalated and on September 25th, members of the WTRF broke into an armory, seizing weapons, and then began blockading major ports of entry to the Volta region. Two police stations were also attacked and three police officers, including a district commander, taken hostage. About 12 hours before all this even began, the WTRF posted photos of a graduation ceremony for some 500 individuals who underwent military training for months in a secret location. So yeah, things were escalating rather quickly. And a few days later, separatists attacked a facility belonging to the State Transportation Corporation in the city of Ho, setting a number of vehicles ablaze, and an order was given for all Ghanan police officers to leave the region in 24 hours. 
Police, nevertheless, would later arrest 30 people, with one civilian being killed in exchange of gunfire. For his part, Papavi has made clear that neither he nor the Homeland Study Group Foundation was involved in what some have begun to label the Western Togoland Rebellion, stressing his call for dialogue and non-violent resolution of the matter. In all fairness, there are many groups pushing the issue of Western Togoland independence, and many don't really operate as uniform organizations. For instance, take the People's Liberation Council of Western Togoland, which found itself in a weird situation when a video popped up of its members, supposedly, claiming to be the dragons of Western Togoland military army, who had trained some 4,000 people and were now ready to re-enter Ghana to achieve their objective of independence by military means. Okay. These are the dragons of Western Togoland military army. About 4,000 300 dragons are trained in a nearby country. They are ready to enter into their motherland west in Togoland. They are not rebels. They are not militants. They are well full, they are well full trained soldiers. So nobody should be afraid of them. They are coming to deliver their motherland west in Togoland. The only problem is that the People's Liberation Council of Western Togoland claims these are not their members, nor do they endorse their actions or condone any violence in the ongoing situation. So, yeah. It's really hard to say who is doing what because there doesn't really seem to be any coherent organization structure and there's almost certainly splinter groups within the movement. Where things go from here is anyone's guess, but I really don't think you're going to see Western Togoland popping up on the map anytime soon. What may occur, and what most of the separatists say they actually want, is for the United Nations to look into the matter of the 1956 referendum and whether the people of Western Togoland are allowed a say-so on whether they should become an independent nation or at least to have some determination of what their future should be. Now whether the UN gets around to that this year is an entirely different subject because, you know, we have coronavirus and all the other fun from 2020, I don't think the issue of Western Togoland is very high on the UN's list of priorities. But you never know. And there does seem to be enough going on in that part of Eastern Ghana to fuel a continuous separatist movement in the region. I mean, it's done so since the 1950s, at least. Now, that all being said, most of those who support separatism or independence for Western Togoland are centered in the Volta region. There doesn't really seem to be this universal mass appeal throughout the whole of what would be called Western Togoland. Moreover, when you look at the Volta Regional House of Chiefs, there is not anything in terms of official government support, even in the Volta region, for Western Togoland independence. Now sure, you could argue this is because they're being coerced or something like that, but there just doesn't seem to be this mass support for Western Togoland independence. I'm not saying there isn't any, there clearly is support, and there clearly are outstanding issues in terms of economic and political uh, underrepresentation in Ghana, and those will continue to give fuel to stuff like this. But in terms of actual mass appeal for breakaway from Ghana, I'm just not seeing it, at least at this point in time. But as with all things, it's a fluid situation, and I don't think most saw the events of September 2020 happening, so you never know. Things could take a turn in a very unexpected way. Anyway, thank you so, so much for listening to my episode. I really hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please feel free to like or subscribe to the channel, and I'll see you again next time. Peace.